Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks for taking a break, and now I know we have your full attention. Uh, I'm Millie Murray Ward. I'm with CSU Stanislaus, a partner in the Creed Grant with Berkeley and the public school partners um, in three school districts in Stanislaus County. Uh, my colleague here is Chris Rowe. Chris is the director of the grant on our campus. And um, we also, this presentation also includes Jim Burns, who was instrumental in a lot of the data collection and analyses. And um, Jim said he wouldn't come up here and sit because he's busy, but if we had any questions, he would answer them. And our other two presenters are our school principals. Unfortunately, Rob um, Williams has been with us all day, but he had a 3.30 commitment, so when we uh, got off schedule a little bit, we lost him, and we're sorry, but we do have his comments in the presentation. So, um, and then the other person who won't be with us today is Adrian Machado, who's the principal at Pittman Elementary in Stockton. Um, Adrian's uh, comments are also in the presentation, but what is so interesting about Adrian's position is the entire school is Creed. And that has had a major impact on retention, as you'll see with some of the findings. Anyway, um, we're, we want to make this interactive as much as possible, so um, we wanted to start by saying that this presentation really has a sort of an element of so what and now what. There's a lot of really interesting things that happen in the process of becoming a Creed trained teacher. There's a lot of interesting instructional changes that happen as a result of that process. But as you know, the national statistics say that every year we lose 14 to 15 percent of our own profession. And by the time people are in their fifth year, we have lost 50 percent of the people who began five years earlier. It is a terrible loss. It is incredibly costly. And what is worse, it is a terrible burden on schools. It creates uneven delivery of instruction. It makes it very difficult to stick to goals. It creates inconsistencies that the children see and pick up makes innovation very, very difficult. So trying to find ways to hang on to our students, get them in, hang on to them through teacher training, and move them into quality jobs where they feel they will stay, that they feel they are part of a community, is one of the reasons why this presentation is here. So uh, giving that kind of context, we titled this Teacher Recruitment and Retention Then and Now. And the reason we did that is because this, is, this covers the three full years of the grant. And here we are um, at the end of um, the school year in 2009. And so a lot of things have happened since the grant started um, in, uh, several years ago. And so uh, we want to go ahead and, and I'm dealing with a Mac here and I'm a PCer. So Help somebody. Arrow right arrow. Right there you go. Yeah. Okay. This is just a summary from the program. We'll skip that. We're going to talk about several different kinds of things that happened here. And I really hope that as you're thinking about this and hearing what we're telling you, that you would have some questions and some comments about how, to, how such things might work in, in your setting. How many people here are from the public schools? Uh, would be, are really concerned about recruitment and retention of teachers. Okay, all right. We want everybody's comments on this, but I think one of the things we want to do is have you think about what are the implications for hanging on to all of these people that we have spent so much effort trying to develop into incredibly high quality teachers because this model obviously really works. It's very compelling. How do we keep people in it and how do we keep people going? So um, we're going to take this from two different levels. Um, at CSU Stanislaus, I have been concerned about retention uh, because at the time the grant um, opened at CSU Stanislaus, I was the dean of the College of Education. Um, I now do research inside the grant, but retention is a huge issue for all universities. Recruitment and retention of students is uh, also a very uh, important issue because of consistency in instruction and also the cost it takes to recruit a student, get them through the process, and get them out the door. Um, it not only is expensive, but it doesn't look good when the original accrediting body comes that they keep falling out of the program. So there's a practical reason as well, so uh, on that side. So we're going to talk about a couple of things in terms of recruitment. 
how did Stanislaus, working with the grant and the public school people, deal with um, the process of recruiting students? We had meetings and orientations for the multiple subjects uh, program candidates involving the grant. We had scholarship opportunities. We had training opportunities and meetings with school personnel as part of the process of, of getting them into the program. For retention, very important issue, this grant had scholarships for the Creed scholars, and um, that's a very important issue. Uh, regular meetings with candidates in, um, in a special way other than the traditional meetings that would take place as part of being in the program. Uh, meetings of the disciplinary and teacher education faculty groups by subject area, a very, very interesting process. Uh, candidate teacher and faculty create training and coaching, which we've been hearing about all day today in different configurations over the course of the years of the grant. And student teachers placed with creed trained master teachers have all turned out to be retention uh, factors in, in keeping people in the program and then getting people into the schools and keeping them there. Um, one of the things that is a big issue in higher education, especially in a, an institution that's relatively large as is CSU Stanislaus, is that it takes a lot of time to get people into the system. And when I became dean there, it was a four-month turnaround from application to acceptance, and it was not acceptable. So one of the things we did, and it, it was important for this grant as well, because if we tied up the students when the grant applications and the scholarships were there, we would not be able to give them to the students, is to create one-stop admission sessions in which we would go to the site. Students would be told that these were going to happen. They had to bring their documents. They filled out their applications, they got their orientation, they paid their application fees. If they met all the criteria, they were automatically admitted on the spot and they could enroll in classes that night. And we, we did increase the yield out of the pool of candidates very quickly in doing that. Another thing that we did, uh, which was a temporary fix, which looks like it won't last, but worked in some ways, was to look at the CSET um, requirement. Um, if you're out of state, the CSET is the California content um, um, subject matter exams that all people take for a credential here. And um, there are three areas in each of the subject matter exams. We decided to conditionally accept students who had passed two of the three areas and then offer um, coaching in the other areas to help them pass the areas. Um, we also spent a lot more time, and this was supported greatly by the grant, or doing orientations through the different departments, including um, teacher ed and liberal studies. And because liberal studies is such a, um, a key partner in the process of credentialing elementary teachers, um, they really were major partners in this grant with us. We also had a set of incentives. Uh, which were scholarships provided by the grant, and we had a few others in, this, in the uh, system ourselves. Um, we used the opportunity of students to work with Cree-trained master teachers as a way to in incentivize students to come into the program. Once they figured out what it was, and then they started getting some training, and they were in pedagogical classes with faculty who had also been pre-trained. That's a great way to keep students in the system because the classes are interesting, stimulate. It isn't just for little kids. It works with big people, too. And so what would happen was classes became more interesting, compelling, exciting. And then going, uh, they also had the opportunity to receive more training and coaching themselves as they move through the um, the process of getting their credential. Um, here's a few statistics to kind of uh, sort of put things in context. Prior to the grant, we had just 14 scholarships for over 400 applicants in, in teacher education, which is the number of people we put through uh, the application process each year. Uh, Creed got us another 100, and we used them all. Um, it really made a big difference because the students understood that they were creed scholars. This makes you special and distinctive. Students were interviewed in order to be eligible to get these. They had to meet all criteria. And so the creed scholars were a special group of students all the way through the program. Um, everybody's special, but they were more special. Um, <laughs> 
And, um, and then you can see that this is an area where I was a little surprised, but it turned out that even though we put through about 400 students a year in the application process, that number did not go up during the term of the grant. So after doing a little digging, one of the things that, there are several things that were happening during this time. Um, we were beginning to see the economic downturn in California. The number of jobs available to teachers were starting to be reduced. And, and so what was happening is the word was starting to get out that there might not be an opportunity to have a job at the end of this process. And of course, as people's finances get worse, not everybody can afford to come back to school. And not to mention the fact that our student teaching requires a full-time commitment, and so people couldn't afford to leave their jobs. So the number of people who actually applied to the program stayed the same. However, the population shifted. And if you look down at the bottom here, I don't know why these equal signs get all screwed up, but you could, you could get the idea. Prior to the grant, uh, we had about a 70.5% completion rate from those applicants who, who first entered the program. During the grant, that dropped to about 60% for some of the reasons I just named, even though people were in the program. But the Creed scholars, of the 100 who came into the program, only two did not finish. So what? So everything. <laughs> So um, those statistics are part of a much longer paper that will appear in the proceedings. But the other part of the methodology involves the mixed methods, which we're going to talk about here in, in just a minute. And Chris is going to take this over and talk about what we got in the next phase of the analysis. We actually looked at um, HR directors who were hiring in the public schools. We were looking at the three principals who we targeted who had had the most experience with Creed. Um, and they included Rob Williams, um, Adrian Machado, Rob from Fairview and Modesto, Adrian Machado from Pittman and Stockton, and uh, the principal at Riverbank. And his, his name just went out of my head. Maria, what's his name? Bill Redford. Bill, Bill sorry, Bill Redford. Um, and I talked to him three times, too, isn't it? Terrible. Um, and student teachers, we had about 10 and 34 master teachers who we interviewed um, either in focus groups or individually. We also, beyond the scope of the, paper, the information being presented today, also conducted individual interviews with CSU faculty. But they are in another presentation to happen in the future, so we've focused this down on just this group of people. Um, our instruments included a variety of surveys for the student teachers and master teachers, individual interviews with the principals and the HR directors and the focus groups with the master teachers. We had done this earlier in the grant, so this was my revisit in spring of 2008. So we used a lot of the same questions and then questions that seemed logical as time had passed for the, the institution of the grant. So now what Chris is going to do is he's going to talk about what we got in the and the results from these um, different types of pieces of, of data. And then we're, I'm going to come back and we're going to talk together about the, um, uh, I'll do a summary of what we found and incorporated, and that incorporates the comments of the principals and we can have a conversation. Again, I want to know what your experiences are and what you have seen that has worked to retain teachers in the school because that is the bottom line, okay? Great. Thank you, Millie. And I came into the grant at the beginning, and I was trained by Anila and Serena, so it was great to see them here again as an assistant professor at Santa Claus State. And I used the content in my classes with my teachers who are in the methods program for social studies or reading or uh, in my graduate classes as well. So I know this works. The teacher candidates love it. They don't get to use it all the time in the classrooms that are not creed-centered, but they see that it does work and would love to continue this uh, in their own classrooms. When the stars align and let things happen in education. The survey responses that we got, the survey says, students did agree that Creed had enabled some collaboration to recruit teacher candidates. A lot of that was based upon the uh, scholarships that we provided. They were really into the scholarships and were grateful for those. But a lot of it was the content as well, what they were seeing in the classrooms and what they were, what they were uh, learning. The master teachers agreed the student teacher in interest in the pedagogy was essential in order, in order for them to have a good working relationship. They agreed that previous Korean training would be important for the student teachers to use them in the classroom as well. And some would agree that Korean enabled collaborations to recruit teacher candidates. 
if you want to add something I left down, please okay. do. Okay. Uh, the, for the focus groups with the human resources directors, one director was hired, uh, he hired uh, Creed teachers and recommended them to other teachers or other schools as well. Two directors got to see the teachers, student teachers and master teachers in action, in action, as well as the guest teachers. Those were the student teachers who were subbing on campuses, they call them guest teachers, and they would be uh, implementing the Creed product in the classroom, which uh, they were very impressed with as well. And they would hire Creed teachers if they had openings at their school districts or in their schools. The principals liked to hire from the student teacher pool who were Creed trained, especially at the Pittman Elementary School and the Riverbank Language Academy. They were the fully Creed schools where every teacher was uh, trained. Uh, as I said right there, next bullet down there. One principal would hire Creed teachers if he had the space available for teacher candidates and the openings. With the master teachers, the Creed training was a criterion in selecting their student teachers. They wanted someone who had the knowledge level that they were on, the pedagogical skills that they were um, experiencing as well. They could share that uh, com, um, collaboration together. Creed trained student teachers, they fit well with the school's philosophies, especially at the two schools who were fully uh, Creed implemented, to focus on language development, the student engagement, of course, and the collaboration. Uh, Creed trained student teachers were developed strong working relationships with Creed master teachers through their professional uh, conversations and also collaborations. I don't know why I'm nervous, but suddenly I am for whatever reason. In one case where the student teacher was not Creed trained, the master teacher made it very clear that she was going to use Creed and expected the student teacher to step up and learn the process as well, which was a success. Uh, the median server responses for retention uh, student teachers, they strongly agreed the product, the project provided student teachers the time, sorry, necessary conditions for modeling, learning, and supporting the effective strategies they were receiving with, for diverse learners. The master teachers agreed the opportunity to receive Creed training is an incentive to stay at the school site. They agreed working with the Creed trained teachers as an incentive to stay at the school. Can um, I repeat that one? Okay. I don't, I don't okay. Know working with other Creed teachers. That was the important part, the collaboration amongst themselves in their grade levels and also at the entire school site. That was important. The third bullet down, that having access to student teachers who received Creed training was an incentive to stay at the school site. We kept the feeder line open for those schools. Pittman and Riverbank Language Academy especially would look for teachers who were, uh, had the, uh, the ability to um, share that information and learn Creed to go on into those school sites. And we, we, streamline those student teachers to those master teachers. They also somewhat agreed the project enabled collaborations between CSU and the LEA to support and train teacher candidates to meet short-term and long-term goals. The human resources directors in terms of retention, uh, they said it was not a, a role for teachers leaving the district, but they didn't say necessarily it was a role for people staying with the, with the school site. So Creed does not seem to play a role in teacher departures, which we would think that makes sense. Two schools were being Creed trained by, uh, or being willing to be Creed trained was a condition for employment according to the principal focus group. The principals encouraged Creed teachers to apply or student teachers to apply for positions as they became open. And Creed tra trained student teachers, they fit in well with the philosophies of the school, uh, the focus on language development as stated before in student engagement as well as collaboration. And also the principals observed teachers and student teachers they were to be more engaged in professional conversations as well as casual interactions. The impact on retention in terms of master teachers, two schools, the Creed trained student teachers deliberately matched those two uh, master teachers at the uh, Pit, uh, Pittman, uh, sorry, Pittman Elementary and also the Riverbank Language Academy. It was a uh, deliberate connection there. In deliberate Creed, student teachers and master teacher match, matches, the focus was on working relationships. They had match philosophies, they had common vocabulary, conceptual base, and also collaborated and shared ideas and planning. Beginning teachers were trained and coached by veteran Creed master teachers. Beginning teachers learned more about doing Creed centers uh, with their master teachers, or from their master teachers, sorry about that. Coaches helped uh, beginning teachers focus on improvement, and some beginning teachers had no Creed coaches, but they had bits of coaches. So there was some coaching involvement. The key there was uh, coaching by the master teachers. All right, next part. One of the other parts of this um, area of study was to ask the teachers about their change in their actual pedagogical um, repertoire of skills. 
And so we asked them about what they did in, in terms of relative frequency during a week, in terms of things that were related to creed pedagogy. And the ones that are um, in uh, boldface are the ones where we showed um, at least one level of improvement from that level when they started the program. The ones that improved was um, the teacher said, I have students working with others, meaning other students. I implement activities which allow small groups of students and teacher to produce new uh, uh, knowledge of products. I engage students through dialogue, lots and lots of language. Um, I plan and implement activities which engage students in sustained conversations, reading or writing. I focus on developing appropriate content, vocabulary, and language. And I engage in conversations with students which relate students' formal school knowledge to the students' individual community and family knowledge. Now, there are other items in the survey, but these are the ones that focus on pedagogical changes that are directly related to the creed standards. And so this shows us that in all but two cases, there was at least one level of change. This certainly supports everything we've heard today about the change in um, the quality of instruction observed by the coaches that Anala and Serena and the other panelists were presenting earlier. So there's a lot of cross-validation going on here. And there are a number of other pieces to these surveys which we will present in future papers and other venues. So that's what we got. And, and so the next step is, now what? How did this really look to the principals at the school site? And these are the pieces that Adrian and Rob are going to present. And so in your handout, even though they're very small and they're, they're on the table there, you can see what their comments were. And um, I would really like this to be a time when you think about, does this fit with your notion of what happens when an innovation works? Um, and, and do you see ideas for how you could use these comments in work that you are doing, regardless of your position? Uh, one of the comments was the CRE training and scholarships attracted to CSU Stanis students to CSU Stanislaus. That came from a principal, not from me. So that was a real interesting observation, that they knew that the students were coming for the training and for the scholarships. Um, it is easier to recruit teachers through creed and retain them. They want to be part of this exciting project. This also came from a principal. And basically, this came from, um, from a uh, one of the principals where it was a requirement to be creed trained to join the faculty. And so there was no trouble getting people to come in if they had this creed training. Um, teacher, uh, characteristics in, uh, teacher characteristics in terms of creed and non-creed, uh, um, matches between all the partners. There was much more of a common purpose when the student teacher and the master teacher were both creed trained. They started earlier and more often sharing common philosophies and views. They didn't have to go through a lot of very typical um, initial orientation when a student teacher comes into the classroom for the first time. Um, and in the case of one of the principals, um, in an interview I did with him, which is not on the slide, um, the principal said that he had different types of dialogues with the student teachers who were creed trained. They were far more ready to move into the classroom, their level of understanding of the teaching process was deeper, and therefore those conversations were much more professional than they were with people who were not creed trained. Now, does this have implications for our Non-creed student teaching program? You betcha. Uh, another thing that happened was the, the uh, schools did recruit creed trained teachers for student teachers and then use them as a pool of potential recruits. This is really important. If we don't have a pipeline into the jobs, then the sustainability of preparing student teachers to do this is going to dissipate because as you have said in many of the presentations today, if you don't have a critical mass of people uh, at a school site that welcome and value these pedagogies, it's very hard to sustain them. 
Um, and then Rob added a few things here, and I'm just going to kind of paraphrase what he said here. He felt that the Cree teacher, teachers exhibited much more efficacy as teachers and competence. And that gets to that comment I said earlier. The student teachers came into the school and he had a different relationship than he did with them than he did with non-creed student teachers. Um, and then all of the relationships between the university faculty, the student teachers, the master teacher, and the principal seem to be deeper. And I think I'm just going to offer my hypothesis that that is one of the reasons why we had a much higher retention rate with the Creed student teachers. There's a common vocabulary, common goal, common philosophy. There's much more mentoring of students as they move through the process of getting their credential. And so as a result of that, they tend to stay. Um, and then teachers, uh, We've already talked about this one. They appreciate the activities, as, and, and that shows up in the surveys, that they felt that having the creed training, being in a creed-focused school, was an incentive to stay there. Um, and then um, I'm just going to skip this last one, and we're gonna, because it deals with some of the other things on this next page. Um, Practically, the principals noticed that the teachers were more skilled at writing genuine student-centered lesson plans that engage and interested the students. Very important if you want to stay on task. Uh, they received the extensive coaching, and we already know that they appreciated it, um, and they became much more comfortable with the Creed model, but they also became more comfortable with being observed and having professional dialogues. Uh, and then the Cree trained teachers were more likely, the student teachers were more likely to get those positions at the, at the Creed schools because it was a requirement to be on the faculty. So it created a sort of a natural pipeline. They got to look at our student teachers, if they liked what they saw, when the jobs were there, they were the first to hear about them. And, um, and uh, another observation that was made by the principals was that the creed training seemed to bond the teachers together with their colleagues. And again, we've heard this a number of times today. You need a critical mass of people who share a common philosophy at a school in order to maintain the innovation. If you don't, the pressure of the main culture crushes it. Um, and I've been doing program evaluations for a long, long time, and that finding has resurfaced for years when I've done broad brace uh, professional development um, program evaluations. When there's only one teacher at a school site, it's very hard for them to keep it up. Um, and then finally, uh, teachers appreciate retention activities and feel that they've become better teachers. So I guess what we'd like to do, we've got a few minutes and we promise not to keep you very long because you've been very nice and patient. but, um, but what do you hear in what we said that resonates with you and tells you what you should be doing to try to keep this going? This is the now what part. Because there, you know, I'm a policy person. What's the policies here, mm -hmm. if nothing else? Yes. Well, I think I really admire your program because it, uh, you know, it gave the teachers or the pre-service teacher a very solid theoretical and pedagogical model. My question is, and I've been in teacher education all my life, and I see that a component that is key for teacher retention is that they come in with um, an intention, a drive for social justice and a lot of them are from underserved populations. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you, um, if, if it was part of the model to recruit some uh, teachers from underserved populations. And, if, how, and if, if it was indeed, how did you uh, target that population? Well, it wasn't, a, one of the things that, is, there's a yes and no to this answer. Mm -hmm. Stanislaus is um, a Hispanic serving institution. We're one of the 100 in the country labeled as such. Many of our students are, are from Latino backgrounds. We also have a lot of other students from diverse backgrounds. So when you look at our student population, without doing any personal, per, per, 
purposeful, mm -hmm. excuse me, recruitment, we actually retain a very diverse population and, and we've always recruited and retained them mm -hmm. through this process. Um, and you gotta remember that in places like the Riverbank Language Academy, you can't even get on the faculty unless you're fluent in English and Spanish. Um, and uh, so there hasn't been that effort to just go after a diverse population of students. We have a very active BCLAD program or bilingual program. We have a lot of faculty, students who are from diverse populations and standing in front of them as a diverse faculty. And so there isn't that push from the grant to do that, but there is that kind of natural outreach to the community we serve because of the region where we are. Okay? Anybody else? One of the things that I was impressed with in the data that you showed early on and uh, in some of the discussion this morning is that uh, students uh, um, and mentors seem to value the relationship of the common language and that keeps them at the school. And uh, you talked just a moment ago about how difficult it is to maintain this when you're going against the flow in your own school. And so from a policy point of view, uh, when we first started off the, the research project that, well, this is the same research project, we split it all through Modesto. And we left little cadres all over in different schools. And it seems to me that we're not only trying to change individual behavior, but systemic behavior, and that we should approach it uh, perhaps be a policy of approaching systems because without changing the system, we do not give and uh, create an environment where someone can actually carry it out beyond the period when they're supported by a coach. Mm -hmm. And our coaching has always been a limited resource, and so we need to be able to create stronger beachheads, so to speak, where we can dig in, trench in, and um, really create the system that also supports the change in the individual teaching uh, in, in this pedagogical method. I think that's really true. And in, in the case of Riverbank Language Academy, maybe Maria can speak to this, but um, that academy was started by a cadre of teachers who were very unhappy with how the school district was handling English learners. And so they developed the charter. Um, Maria shaking her head, yes, I got that right. Uh, but the other thing is that they were looking for a model that would involve high quality pedagogical techniques to use with English learners. And that's why this was a good match for them. And that buy-in has created an atmosphere in the school where this is not only accepted, it's nurtured. And in fact, in the focus group that I, I, I collected there, um, that I held there last uh, spring, a year ago this, from today, mm -hmm. um, one of the things that surprised me is that when the coaching started to disappear, people were coaching each other. It also happened at Pittman. So that means that there's, there's glue holding them together. And when you look at the, the literature from Marilyn Cochran Smith, when you look at the Ingersoll stuff, all the things about retention says it's got to be a community. That's why people stay. I think it also relates to what Roland said earlier this morning about leadership, having a strong leader. And at both of the sides, Pittman and Riverbank, they had strong principals who believed in the program and were supportive. And that was also part of that group. Absolutely. Lisa. OK. Um, I'm interested in policy as well, in infrastructure. And actually, I'm not going to answer your question. I'm going to ask you both a question. I find it very fascinating um, that even though we are focusing on teachers in the classroom, that actually the study was, um, we'll say, an experiment to redesign an institution of higher education, teacher education program. And when we talk about cultural change, that's institutional change within an IHE is huge. Huge. So it really is. my question is, as we wind down this TQ project, you as former dean, you as the chair, what are your thoughts about how to sustain this kind of the creed 
um, focus in your teacher education programs to maintain the cross-college collaborations and to help support your students as you recruit them? Well, several of the people who um, were on the panel earlier with the science project uh, that Trish was talking about were part of that cross-college uh, collaborative. At one point, uh, liberal studies was in arts and letters. It's now inside the College of Education. And liberal studies seminars were held in this manner. So we not only had teacher ed faculty, we also had undergraduate discipline faculty who were trained in these pedagogical techniques. Um, and those continue to go on. In fact, Chris and I were having a conversation about this earlier, that he still runs his classes like this and he's going to for a long time. That pipeline of seeing it as an undergraduate in your fifth year of teacher mm -hmm. prep and then seeing it in the school really settles in and, and helps students internalize this way of looking at students and looking at the act of teaching. That's what we think. And I think Roland might agree. <laughs> yes, I, yeah, I certainly do. And uh, I, I wanted to um, make a, a couple of observations. In, in the first place, this, uh, this is a fantastic report. This is one of the most interesting things I've, uh, I've seen in years. And I, I think it's publishable. I sure hope you will. We it's a very, to. very, yeah, I imagine. <laughs> it's, uh, it's wonderful stuff. And I would just like to suggest there's two elements here. One of them, it, it, you, you could look at this as though this was an, an excellent uh, enactment of uh, something kind of approaches the professional school model and that in, in which supposedly there's, you know, there's supposed to be the LEA and the IHG and close collaboration mm -hmm. and et cetera, et cetera, which, but which uh, ra rarely produces this kind of result. Uh, and I think, I, I don't mean to make light of that because I think the multi-level integration and so forth is absolutely vital and, uh, and very, very important to what you had happened. I'd also like to suggest there may be another thing that's going on when in, in, uh, in, in the, the way this uh, program was organized, and I'm taking no credit for this, I had practically nothing to do with this project, and I'm just admiring it from the outside is that, is that um, at every level and at every interface, there's so much joint activity. So uh, it, it, from the coaching to what goes on in the, in the different kind of university classrooms, et cetera, et cetera. And we, we know perfectly well from, uh, from all, our, all our theory and all our previous experience that joint activity leads to the development of intersubjectivities and that leads to people liking each other and that leads to wanting to be together and not go away, et cetera. We know, we know that that is a part of it. So I, I would suggest that, the, that this pattern of, in, of, of joint activity at each one of the different interlocking levels has, does create the, the sense of community. And then just one, one last observation is, I also think that there is something uh, specific about, um, about uh, the cultural historical activity founded um, pedagogy that intensifies this enormously. What we, f what we find repeatedly is, why do teachers stay? One of the reasons I suggest they stay is, I have seen this over and over and over again since the first days at, at, uh, at Keep from 40 years ago, what I've seen is that this form of pedagogy allows a, a creation of a relationship between student and teacher that does not happen in the in the standard methods of instruction. And that, uh, w what we see repeatedly is, teachers might work harder, they might find themselves staying at later at night, et cetera, but they like it because they get the experience of participating in the development of children, which is why they wanted to be teachers in the first place. And then this is happening, it's, it, it's, it's so satisfying. So I think part of this is structural, administrative, organizational, should be policy everywhere, but I think a part of it, a vital part, and certainly an intensification factor, is that activity pattern 
that, ex that brings the student-teacher relationship into the center of the whole thing. Nobody wants to give that up if they've ever experienced it. That's right. That's right. Hello, I'm Janine Richardson from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, and I sort of feel like Cinderella having arrived at the ball after the slipper was lost <laughs> today. I'm also the single subject coordinator at Cal Poly, so I train secondary school teachers. And I have a couple of observations and a question for you. First of all, it seems as if the principals we work with have not been adequately trained in instructional leadership. Mm -hmm. I'm very, <laughs> was that a loaded, that was the bomb, that was the bridge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 uh, my husband's a superintendent of personnel in a school district and I know from all the hiring that's going on, it's not teachers by the way, but from the hiring that's going on, it is reflecting what we're anticipating about people retiring in the state of California. And if creed is going to have the big impact that I believe it can, we need to educate principals because the turnover is huge. We have so many new principals coming in San Luis Obispo County, Northern Santa Barbara County in this next year and they're ripe for this. Mm -hmm. They're new people coming into the profession. They're not transferring from other schools. They're teachers who've been trained in educational leadership and are moving into that position. And the same thing is true with teachers retiring. Now, it's not happening quite yet. At least I keep telling my candidates that. You know, you don't want to feel like a fraud standing in front of people preparing exactly them to right. teach. I'm an English professor, so I I'm saying this is a great profession, but you might not get a job for five years. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, uh, but they're coming into the profession and this is the time where we can make an impact. It might not happen for about five years, but between now and 10 years out, when thousands of teachers retire in California, we can make a big change. So my question is, I know the grant is coming to an end, mm -hmm. but my question is, are there plans to have professional development for people outside of multiple subject credential, can we move this into the single subject credential program? And what kind of plan is there for preparing coaches? Because I'm on the cusp of retiring myself. But this is something that I would really love to do. And I believe I'm ready to do it because I've been coaching student teachers in the classroom for many, many years. And it's a natural movement, for not just for me, but for other people as well. Where are we going to get that pool of coaches? We need the, the development, the summer workshops or whatever it is to train in Creed so that they can go back and develop the collaborative approach in the classroom. Thank you. Well, sure. Yeah, um, as well as um, the idea of expanding to bring in the administrators, is special education, in, have they been involved in this? No. Okay. No, not that's, that's the next piece to add. Well, they have been, they have at, Pittman, been at the school site. At the school site, Pippin yeah. has a special day class. They have been involved, but at a much uh, smaller scale. It's one teacher, right? No. Right. No, not a, and not as a whole program. Right. Um, we haven't ventured into um, se secondary. Uh, and I think one of, the, one of the reasons that we haven't is um, that these seemed, that because we were dealing with pedagogy design for children, it seemed that even though we're talking about adolescents and sec secondary who sometimes behave like young children, mm. um, it seemed like a more natural fit. Annalie, you might want to speak to this too, but that it would, multiple subjects was a good place to do this. It doesn't mean it couldn't happen, and in fact, some of the people who were trained at the university and had content area classes also prepare secondary teachers and ran their classrooms like this. Mm -hmm. So it's a natural fit to do that. Right now at Stanislaus, we do not have plans to continue professional development, but it's interesting that you bring that up because yesterday I went to my first meeting for another grant project, which will be a long-term professional development in one of our local school districts in math content and pedagogy, and they're looking for a model. So, I decided that they might be interested in this. So, and they were. So, maybe that's the way you plant the seeds mm -hmm. that way. 
And they're looking at 100 hours of additional training in content and pedagogy over a two-year period for 100 teachers. That's pretty ambitious. Mm -hmm. And if it were, and, and my comment to them was yesterday, in the planning, try to think about how you can increase the value of the training by going for receptive sites. And, and, making a, and they're going to make a condition on the basis of that, at least two people at the site, I would prefer three, or 50% of your faculty. This is going to be a math fifth, sixth grade content and pedagogy grant. And I think that's another way you could think about it. So I just came out of that meeting yesterday, got in the car and came here. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I think that that's, that's another way that you could spread the principles that are involved here. Anna? Just was going to make a few comments. One, uh, while we didn't use special ed at Cal State Stanislaus, Ji Mei Chang has been working in the area of special ed for, with Creed for a long time, for those of you who are interested in talking and uh, meeting with her. Also, this issue of um, administrators and educational leadership is central and core. Absolutely. And until instructional excellence becomes an issue for principals, this will continue to be our struggle. It's sort of a hierarchy. It's easy, easy for us to recruit elementary teachers to this sort of professional development. I have found the secondary teachers, especially in the high schools now where we're working in Indiana, that they are much more vulnerable and guarded and protected in engaging in this kind of process. And um, the leadership component is sort of the next frontier. Special Ed has also been extremely responsive. Anybody in Special Ed who has come to be part of the Creed coaching process understands this is what they already do by definition. They now have labels to work with it. And the only thing they wish is that their partnering teachers had had the same preparation so that they could make two instructional conversations happen at the same time. Uh, regarding leadership, I think Noni Rees is an exemplar of how she involved all the teachers in, uh, in her school. So come up and, and talk about it <laughs> rather than I talk about it. Am I the only leader here? <laughs> <laughs> I'm the chair of Ed Leadership. And what I tell teacher education is, you guys are my pipeline. Yeah. You're my pipeline. The stronger prepared the pre-service programs, the stronger the pre-service programs, the stronger the leader. The stronger the instructional leader at the get-go, the stronger, the better my job, the easier my so job. Mm -hmm. Principals yeah. don't come to me, t teachers don't come to me as blank slates. Mm -hmm. They come from years of pre-service training. This kind of pre-service, I'd love these folks in my program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in fact, when I was a principal, I was a, princ a Creed principal with Roland at, at uh, Professional Development School. But I need to tell you pre-service, without being defensive, the stronger your programs with instructional leadership, the stronger my students, the better the principals. And we do, I think we have to work together. Yeah, and, and I, I would like to say something because uh, Rob and Bill and Adrian aren't here. Um, they really were models for getting this going and keeping this going. Mm -hmm. um, and it was because they were open to that process.